While we wait here for a moment, I'm seated in Washington, D.C. with actually both of my colleagues, where we are seeing uh, one of the cicada broods come back on their 17-year cycle. And you may have been reading about it in the papers. It's really interesting. Uh, these red-eyed little bugs, actually fairly large bugs, uh, crawl out of the dirt in, in the mornings and during the day and uh, shed their skin and start flying up to the nearest tree they can find uh, to carry on the species to the next generation, I suppose is the way to put it. And then they die. It's a very short but brief and spectacular life for these cicadas, and they make quite a din. That's always fun, at least for those who survive Washington longer than 17 years. <laughs> I know that there are other folks still joining. I can see it uh, across the scroll, but I think it's it's an exciting time and I'd like to get started. And those who are uh, joining uh, a little bit late will be able to catch the flow of the conversation, I think, very soon. So why don't, why don't we get started? I'm Kevin Ewing. Um, I'm a partner at Bracewell. Um, I'm resident in the Washington, D.C. office, and I have a really fun morning for myself this, this morning and hopefully for, for all of you who are joining because I get to have an extended conversation with two of my favorite colleagues, Jeff Homestead and Ann Navarro. And many of you know both Jeff uh, and Ann, uh, but it's, it's worthwhile having a, a quick introduction, um, which I'll do briefly and then we'll sort of get rolling. Jeff leads our environmental strategies group here at Bracewell, uh, which was founded I don't know, how many years ago now is it, Jeff, that... that uh, 2000, 2006. Yeah, that's right. That, that's, I, I feel like it's almost got a you know, uh, cycle, cycle date to it. We'll, we'll have to think about that uh, in our uh, swag. In any event, Jeff leads the ESG group uh, at Bracewell, and he, of course, prior to that was, was the assistant administrator at EPA for air and radiation under uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, uh, George W. Bush, excuse me. and he started out actually with the former Bush um, as a counsel to the president, George Walker, Walker Bush in the White House, years earlier uh, when the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 were, were making their way through Congress and needed to be shepherded uh, by the White House. And so I would think it's fair to say that, Jeff, you've got your fingerprints all over that statute. Uh, um, and that, that, I think, has given you a unique perspective on the cycle of policy questions that arise um, and also where we have been and where we're heading on climate change, which is part of the topic we're going to have today. And joining Jeff uh, and me also is Ann Navarro. Ann spent 25 years uh, as a top litigator and a policy advisor on uh, federal lands issues of, of all kinds. As a trial lawyer um, at NRD for over a decade, decade in the Justice Department, and then 10 years litigating and managing litigation on the civil side for the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so lots of wetlands related stuff, lots of uh, 408 and uh, 404 issues and, and related matters, uh, as well as species matters, uh, Protected Species Act um, uh, statutes and the consultations that are required there. She has great depth of insight there. She wound up her public career um, at the Interior Department where she was a senior advisor to the solicitor of the Interior Department, working on policy issues um, of, uh, of real uh, impact, in, including some that have changed recently, the MBTA, um, always a favorite. So Anne's perspective is like Jeff's, uh, born of many years looking at these issues and considering how um, they're viewed in the government and how they roll out uh, to industry. So, welcome to you both. I hope you've had some coffee, uh, Anne and, and Jeff. How are you doing? Thanks, Kevin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be here. And I want to make it clear that I don't take credit for anything in the 1990 amendments. I was only there to watch to watch its birth and to be involved in its implementation. And there are parts of it I would not want to take credit for. I wondered if you were going to give a caveat like that. that that's, that's, that's entirely fair. And, and I'm not going to attribute, Anne, all of the policy decisions of the last few administrations to you either. Um, you, can, you can pick and choose as necessary. But I think, I think having touched and seen these policy uh, questions, nevertheless, uh, that's the perspective we want to unlock today. So what's the topic of our discussion? And what's the format for the discussion? Uh, first of all, we're not, in terms of format, we're not going to have a long 120-page slide deck that we're going to walk you through because we don't think that's going to be as exciting or as interesting 
and it will not allow me to delve in um, and query my colleagues as deeply as I would like to, because they're perfectly capable of, of, of being pushed. And I want to see how far we can we can push them on some of this. Um, and, and the second is is how we want to approach the topic of climate change. You know, I I have just begun uh, to be able to sort of go out to restaurants uh, again, kind of digging out of the pandemic trough. Um, and it's wonderful just to see menus that are not what is in my refrigerator. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I love to cook, but it's great to see the diversity. The one thing I've noticed, though, um, is that no matter what you're ordering, you sort of get a side dish in Washington of climate change. And, and what I mean by that is that it is infiltrated as an issue, as a policy mandate, as, as a mission, uh, the administration's every action. And what we want to unpack today is what does that mean? How is that going to manifest? How are agencies handling that imperative? What is the, what is the imperative exactly? And, and how is it supposed to be incorporated into the work of key agencies that matter to um, the regulated community, whether you are upstream or downstream or midstream in the energy sector or you're renewable or fossil, whether you're infrastructure and you're building highways, uh, bridges, uh, toll roads and the like, all of it ends up coming back to how do agencies um, look at these issues and and how is that changing? So we're going to look at um, direct and indirect regulation of greenhouse gases. I think that's a good place to start. A forewarning, Jeff. Some questions coming to you um, because you know that seems to be the the core. What what is the current state of play? And what will be likely in terms of direct and indirect regulation of greenhouse gases themselves. And then and then we can migrate, I think, from there uh, to a discussion of federal lands and how their management principles are shifting, how leasing and permitting with respect to federal lands and federal waters might be changing and incorporating climate change and, and, and try to be as specific as possible about that. And then uh, infrastructure permitting in general, I think it would be fun to look at what's happening at FERC. Indeed, happening today at FERC, there's some exciting things happening today, uh, at least for some people, um, and, uh, and at the Corps of Engineers. Um, I'm sure we'll end up touching on many other issues, but that's a preview of uh, coming attractions in the conversation. With that in mind, why don't we start kind of in the central core, greenhouse gases, are they regulated, are they not? What's the Supreme Court told us about that? In particular, Jeff, hasn't the landscape of the Supreme Court changed? And does that actually have any meaning or bearing on the conversation we're now having about climate change? Uh, well, I, 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 I think it has to this extent. I mean, I, I've certainly had questions from a few uh, clients wondering whether with the more conservative Supreme Court, they might actually reconsider Massachusetts versus EPA. Um, and, and I know that there are some uh, uh, advocacy groups that are are, are eager to, to push that. I, I, I think I, I think that's not going to happen. Um, I'm, I'm quite confident that the, the Supreme Court understands that uh, it, it C certainly, the members of the Supreme Court don't want it to appear that it's just a matter of it's another political body that um, that that whoever has the most votes, you know, is based on on it's like Congress. I, and I'm sure they're not going to want to do that. However, I I do think the Supreme Court is important because they will be skeptical um, of creative efforts to use existing statutes to deal with climate change. And we, we got a glimpse of that in the UR case a number of years ago now, where the court said, yes, you can regulate greenhouse gases, but you have to regulate it in a way that's permissible under the Clean Air Act. And so I, I, I think the the current administration understands that. There are certainly um, some environmental groups that would like them to be very creative in using different parts of the Clean Air Act uh, to do you know something like the Clean Power Plan, um, and there's a, a variety of ideas that have been pushed by advocacy groups, but I don't think the administration is going to pursue those because I, I think it is aware that that those creative new interpretations are not likely to pass muster with the Supreme Court. Jeff, before we turn even to how EPA may may, may move, let's let me take you a, a quarter step back on the Supreme Court and, and your analysis of that just now. Um, I think you focused on what you anticipate would be a desire on the court's part not to indicate 
indirectly uh, that the political winds are sufficient to change also the, the actual legal posture of the court. Do you think that there will not be uh, attempts to gain their attention, though? I mean, aren't there aren't there cases that are percolating through that are aiming to get a cert petition in front of the court? Do you think they're going to be denying them? Or do you think that, that the issue actually really won't rise to them for decision? So I, I, I think it will. I, I, I don't think they will grant cert on the question of whether they should revisit the um, Massachusetts versus EPA. As, as you know, um, it's not just cases that are appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court only agrees to take a case and hear certain issues in that case. And I just don't think that they will grant cert to hear the question of whether they should reverse Massachusetts versus EPA. Um, you know, I, I think they may cut back on the standing issues that were involved in that case. You may remember that there was some controversy and and you know that that's sort of the broader question where they could shape the the whole issue of standing but i i just don't see that they would grant cert to, to address the central question that was raised in in mass v epa you know let's, let's take that standing question and bookmark it and see if we can get back to it later in a broader context in this conversation because the attempts at establishing standing in relation to broadly speaking climate issues not necessarily Air Act issues, has been advancing a pace. Um, and it might be fun to come back to that. And I, we can address that and say that uh, juicy bit for later. So if, if the court, despite the change of its complexion, so to speak, is, is unlikely really to revisit Mass versus EPA, then where, where does EPA stand then currently? And where do you think it may, might try to head in its decision of whether and how to use the regulatory authority that was, that was sustained at the court? Uh, the, the administration has already said that its three priorities in terms of climate change regulation are cars and light trucks, uh, methane emissions from oil and gas operations, and 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 CO two emissions from from power plants. Uh, the, with respect to the first two of those, they have pretty clear regulatory authority, um, especially when it comes to light cars and trucks. Um, it, it's pretty clear under both the Clean Air Act and the CAFE statute that they have very significant discretion. And I think that is limited by political concerns and economic concerns. But in terms of how they set standards, they could conceivably set a zero grant per mile standard and say everyone has to drive in electric vehicles. That, they're not going to do that. And, and that would be legally problematic because they have to show, you know, make, make certain technology programs. But, but the basic path is well worn. And, and the same is true when it comes to methane emissions from oil and gas operations. EPA has been regulating VOC emissions from those operations for years. Um, the, the, the basic approach is the same. Um, they, they're constrained by what's technically and economically possible. And, and I know that many people uh, who are on this call are, are involved in those in those discussions. So those are the first two. When it comes, though, to industrial emissions, and, and not just power plants, but other types of industrial sectors, the regulatory tools are much more constrained. Um, uh, and... And that's in part because it's they, they can't regulate under Section 110 because there's really no connection to enacts. So the kind of cap and trade program that they've done for other pollutants is not really a possibility. Um, as they've recognized before, they really are, are are likely to have to use Section 111 and 111D, and and th that what that was all about is getting industrial sources to install pollution controls, um, and. I, I don't think anybody thinks that at least in the, at least for now, there will be a requirement to install CCS, um, on, on, even on new sources, much less existing. And so, exactly how they go about that, it will be, it will be interesting to see. I mean, I, I, I know that that we don't have um, a lot of folks who are involved in the power sector here, but they're they're aware of some issues that are being discussed. But I don't think they're going to take another run at something like the clean power plan, just because it would be um, it would be challenging to have that upheld in, in court. I think. And and do you think, Jeff, that the focus, to the extent they do um, uh, take aim directly at power plants, it's really going to be taking aim at, at residual coal uh, uh, fired power, or 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 does it go beyond that? Uh, do you see much happening on the 
on the natural gas fired front? So I, I think they will be a continue to there will be a continued focus on on coal. Uh, although the coal fired generation has been reduced very significantly um, over the past decade, um, there are still I, I think it's somewhere between twenty five and and twenty eight percent or something of our of our electricity comes from coal, um, and given the president's target of reducing CO2 emissions by 50% by 2030, I, every analysis I've seen suggests that you can't, you can't do that if you still have coal-fired power plants around. Um, I, I, I suspect that the way that they will target coal-fired power plants is, is primarily by regulating other conventional pollutants. Um, and you, you know, the, their authority to regulate, especially NOx and SO2 and fine part, part particulate matter, but also water effluent and, and coal ash. Um, you know, we, we saw when the match rule was promulgated by EPA, it didn't target CO2 emissions, but it made some power plants uneconomic. And so a number of power plants closed down. And I, I suspect that they will pursue that kind of a strategy when it comes to coal-fired power plants. With natural gas, it's different. I, I do think it, they're looking at a new um, NSPS uh, for CO2 to, to get slightly lower CO2 emission rates given the current technology. Um, mm. But I, I don't think that's any kind of a real a real sea change. You know, you, you mentioned the topic, I'll just call it bycatch, uh, you know, uh, pursuing regulation of, of, of secondary with secondary benefits, co-benefits, I suppose, is what they call them, um, that, that end up having constraints um, uh, that are perhaps more stringent than the direct constraint being applied. Um, aren't there limits there? Aren't there limits, legal limits, as, as well as perhaps policy prudential uh, limits on how far they can justify um, co-benefits um, to support a regulation that directly attacks a different uh, that question was sort of left up in the air with the with the maps decision. Yeah, um, but what I, what I will say is, as you very well know, as probably everybody on this call knows, that every regulatory program has its own constraints, and whether you're talking about best available technology or you know, uh, reasonably available technology, whatever the statutory standard may, may be, there are lots of constraints in the statute and regulations and in court cases. And EPA certainly has to live within those, but, but within the constraints that they have, they, they believe that there's still more room to regulate. Um, and, and for example, I'm, I'm quite sure that they will do another cross-state air pollution rule to further reduce NOx. And, they, and in fact, they really have to because they, they, they haven't started to implement the new 2015 ozone standard. And mm -hmm. that, and, and under their basic approach, they will be targeting NOx. And so they, they can do that. They, under the section 112, they can come back and revisit the technology determinations for MATS. Um, you know, they're certainly, and I don't want to say it's just a free for all. And I don't, and I don't want to suggest that, um, I don't want to be too apocalyptic, apocalyptic here, uh, because they're not going to go out and and you know do a whole bunch of things that are going to shut down coal fired power plants in the in the immediate future. But especially if they have eight years to tighten up on coal ash, to tighten up on water effluent, to tighten up on SO two, I, I I think they believe they can make coal fired power plants uneconomic, um, and and I think we may see similar things in other sectors. Uh, uh, I think, you know, their thinking is not as far along there, but I, I think that's a, a strategy that we will certainly be seeing. And, and again, the other thing I should say is th th there are certainly people who believe that there are valid separate independent reasons to regulate those pollutants, right? So even if there were no CO2 co-benefits, there are certainly people in the environmental community who are calling for more stringent regulation of to deal with ozone, to deal with PM two point five, to deal with with water quality issues. Let me let me pick up the thread of the political dimension here, um, and and I also invite Anne your your thought on this because um, it's going to be a general question. 
you know, uh, the the art of the possible in Washington for a new administration um, is, is much analyzed in retrospect by administrations that wonder why they didn't accomplish what they set out to accomplish. Um, and those who've been in Washington a long time see the see the see the regular cycle. You know, they come in with an agenda list, whoever that they is, that's this long, and and they're shocked to find that maybe a fifth of it is accomplished uh, in in double the time that they thought it would. What do you think is actually feasible within a single term? Um, you know, and, and I want to draw you into this as well because you you have seen how much time and effort is needed to actually shift regulatory policy, uh, depending on the program you're talking about. And I'd also be interested, as you comment, both of you, on, on how you see or, or don't see the midterm elections, if there's a swing in Congress so that uh, both houses hypothetically turn Republican, does that meaningfully change the direction or the tempo of what the executive branch can, as a practical matter, accomplish on some of these initiatives? Thoughts? I'm going to let Anne go first since I've been speaking so far. Well, okay, um, I'm I'm happy to offer some thoughts. Um, you know, as you said, Kevin, um, you know, every new administration has a lot, a long list of very significant goals um, that often take much longer than folks think they're going to take to implement, um, or don't get accomplished at all. And this administration, I think, is no different as as Jeff pointed out, a lot of outside stakeholders um, and especially environmental groups in the climate space are really pushing the administration hard with some very creative interpretations of an array of statutory authorities, you know, from the Clean Water Act uh, to the Federal Land Policy and Management Act um, and offering the administration a lot of ideas and a lot of the people who authored some of those creative ideas are in fact holding positions in the administration. Um, so one would expect um, them to try to advance some of those ideas. On the other hand, I think we're already seeing evidence that the administration understands because there are a lot of very experienced people on this team that they can't just kind of throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. Um, they need to be very careful and deliberate if they want their their you know, executive branch changes to stay. I mean, I think the most significant thing that I see coming very soon, that's a huge priority that they will be able to get done um, is a new rulemaking under the National Environmental Policy Act, which of course, from where I sit at the dinner party, you know, is kind of the tablecloth that underlays everything. Um, and I certainly see a potential for the administration to to do something very different um, than the Trump rule, of course, and even the longstanding previous rule and add climate specifically to the regulation um, yeah. in order to codify the obligation to consider it in every possible context. I mean, agencies have kind of long considered climate under NEPA in various circumstances, but I could see a move to actually name it in the regulation um, going forward. Which would be fairly striking. Um, so I don't hear, um, I hear you saying there's some political realities or just some general realities about how long it takes to get things done. And so the top priorities move and maybe lesser priorities end up not getting nearly as far along as they, they intend. Jeff, do you, do you, um, do you see any particular uh, party political constraints on what they can accomplish as well, just within the executive branch? But looking over at Congress and at Capitol Hill and what's going on there, I, I, I sort of sense that there are going to be some breaks or at least some friction coefficients that reduce uh, the forward momentum of the executive branch. How do you see that? So, um, you know, th those of us who've lived in D.C. for a long time would say that Congress really has three tools that it can use. It can pass legislation, which hardly ever happens. Right. It, can do, it can do things through 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 funding and budgets, which they're sort of forced to do every year. And then they also engage in significant oversight. And that oversight can um, can can certainly affect the policies of the of the executive branch, as can budgetary issues. Um, you know, given how close the margins are in Congress, we're not going to see, I think, legislative constraints because presumably they would have to, you know, override a presidential veto. 
Um, he's unlikely to sign something that would constrain his own administration, given, given the priority of climate change. But, but I do think a change in Congress w w would have an impact. Um, it would certainly sort of slow down the, the, the pace um, and could, could create other types of constraints. Now, now, having said that, you know, you may remember that for the last years of the Obama administration, both houses of Congress were Republican. And even so, they were ultimately able to adopt the clean power plan and, 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 and adopt very aggressive uh, uh, cafe standards for cars and light trucks. So, you know, th there will be some some pushing back and forth, but, but ultimately um, a, a well-determined administration can do a lot. And, and at that point, you look for constraints, I think, from 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 the court. Kind of the judiciary stepping in. I. It's, it's interesting to, 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 to use as a reference point the Clinton administration, which now seems very distant. Um, uh, the tenor of politics and, and other things having changed quite, quite a lot since then. Um, you know, I, let me turn back then to the AIR Act and what EPA can do. Having touched a little bit the political realm, coming back to the regulatory, um, you know, direct regulation of greenhouse gases um, you know, ad addressing more stringent regulation of conventional pollutants that, that as a as, as a bycatch, so to speak, capture capture benefits, um, forcing some early retirement. Uh, but as you said, you don't see a wholesale abandonment of coal, but rather the the, the continued constriction of the noose. Um, you using all the means at its disposal: waste, water, effluent, um, conventional pollutants. The other area of EPA activity in particular and delegated to the states is enforcement. You know, uh, and I see regulation and enforcement really as two different kinds of tools and and the enforcement tools are and the discretion there are ones that courts give particular deference to EPA on or to any agency on. Enforcement is sort of the core area where executive branch decision making is generally upheld unless it is absolutely ultra -vious. How do you see clean air act enforcement shifting on climate change issues? You, you know, it's interesting. I, like you, I, I participate in seminars and, and listen to people uh, talk about these issues. And th there seems to have been a strain of, um, you know, in industry better watch out because there's just gonna be this huge wave in, of, of enforcement. Um, and it's going to be, you know, focused on 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 environmental justice and climate change. I I, I actually think um, if, if anything, I think the administration's focus on climate change will create opportunities for companies who are involved in different types of enforcement actions. Um, you, you know, you you well know that even though they have significant power. Um, for the most part, when they issue an NOV, what they're interested in doing is coming up with some sort of a, of a settlement. And some of us have criticized that as sort of regulation by litigation. You know, they come up with a plausible claim and then they twist your arm and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go away if you agree to do X, Y, or Z. Um, the, the, the prior administration, um, I think, tried to constrain that in several ways, but, but part of it was by prohibiting the use of supplemental environmental projects um, in in settlements, except where they're specifically allowed by by statute, which is the case with with the Clean Air Act, actually. But but I think that um, I think the Department of Justice and I think some state agencies will be looking for um, settlement terms that include actions that deal with with greenhouse gas emissions, um, and and in some ways that means they can accomplish through enforcement things that they maybe can't do by direct regulation. But, 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 but oftentimes, uh, they may be things that companies want to do anyway. Um, they may be things that have benefits in terms of relationship with the, with the community. Um, so I, I do think that they will, that they will be seeking to use where they can their enforcement authorities to to uh, encourage people to do to do things like that, but I, I don't think we're going to see this huge wave of enforcement. You know, they they have limited resources, and but I, I think the real difference is in the range of things that will be on the table when it comes to settlement. You know, I I, I personally think that 
I agree with that. And I think I'm going to, we're going to see it in, in other areas that I act more under than the Clean Air Act. Um, it, it's, it's going to be in the conditions of settlement. Uh, we call it mitigation broadly, but it'll be the conditions of settlement. And, you know, this Larry Starfield's recent memorandum um, on environmental justice considerations, I think, is a harbinger of what we may see, you know, very specific guidance um, uh, to, to the regions and, and, and others uh, to dramatize, uh, to use the press, to use the media, to, to make a very public uh, uh, the enforcement effort, very, very public about the conditions of mitigation required and to have specific preference given to particular kinds uh, like fence line monitoring is simply, you know, directly mentioned, I want to see that. I want to see fence line mon monitoring in the conditions of settlement. Um, and, and this, I think, could be a game changer for how industry feels its relationship with communities is, is being changed uh, because the data from fence line monitoring will be made public. Many, many companies are comfortable with that or have been getting comfortable with that over the years, but they don't have fence line monitoring yet. Um, we have technology questions about how good that fence line monitoring is, who gets to do it, who gets to interpret it. Um, how, how do you see that unfolding? I mean, it's one thing to, to put in a requirement, say, for fence line monitoring. It's, it's, it's quite another thing to actually see all the implications of that roll forward. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, I, I, I do, th as, as we've talked about things that could happen on, under environmental justice, enforcement, that tool does seem to be coming to the fore. Um, the question of fence line monitoring, in my experience, has varied a great deal facility by facility, not, not only in terms of their comfort level with the technology and, and with the whole idea, but in part on the pollutants that they're emitting. Right. Um, you, you know, if, if, <laughs> if you're a facility that, that, um, that emits ethylene oxide, and EPA's, you know, current iris values suggest that ethylene oxide is, you know, more, it poses a greater danger than plutonium. Um, you, you know, you're going to be very concerned about a, a, a monitor that you believe is going to mislead the public because you think that the, you know, the, that the underlying um, risk assessment that EPA has done substantially overstates the risk. On the other hand, if you are, if you are, if, you know, if your fence line monitors are picking up uh, VOCs that are not regulated as HAPs um, or, or, or things for which you know the res reference con concentration is well above whatever levels it will be at the fence line, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. So mm -hmm. I, I do think it varies a great deal um, based on the, on the specific pollutants that are going to be, that are going to be monitored. And yet, I, I hear you. I agree that, but I'm push, going to push back a little bit. I, I think there is uh, maybe it's a shift in philosophy. I mean, it, you, from uh, a context where you have a regulated facility, and specific things are required to be reported out from that facility. And the very, very it's, it's, it's sort of you don't need to report except as enumerated. And I think when you go to things like fence line, just as an example. Um, I think the, the the telescope shift all the way around to the, the the public is supposed to get all information except we're enumerated and and there's nothing there's nothing not, not enumerated right and so I, I actually think everything becomes much much more public the the degree of focus and the expectations socially that are created um, are much higher than they have been in the past. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah, so, so, but I would ask, why do you think data from fence line monitoring is more potent than, say, TRI data? You know, we, we've seen how that's been used, and, and sometimes those numbers are scary, right? This pollutant, this this facility emitted a thousand tons, or and or or, or a hundred thousand pounds of hazardous air pollutants, and and that that is used um, in some cases, I think, misused. Um, and to, so, to my mind, the fence line monitoring doesn't really go far beyond that unless there is sort of a, a value that is considered to be acceptable, right? Um, so, so, but, but, but I agree, it's going to, it will be a very, it will be a very interesting time over the next few years 
And certainly, and, and even before this administration came in, there was an interest in fence line monitoring, which we started to see some settlements. But clearly, that's going to be a, a, a bigger focus. Yeah, well, but, but let me warn you that you've you've shifted away from our climate change conversation. No, I know. But I know you can't I, help yourself, but it, it, it it's nevertheless I think pertinent because what climate change what we're talking about is really a a, a shift in perspective of the agency, um, and and how far they want to drive it. And that's in the context of many other shifts that they're also trying to accomplish. I think that the two feed into one another. Um, let me just ask you kind of to round out to the discussion. Um, there's a, uh, there, there's a variety of uncertainties that you've pointed to ahead. You have, you've noted that you don't think there's an apocalyptic future in the immediate offing, at, at least related to this issue, which is, which is comfortable and, and comforting. Um, but nevertheless, I don't get the sense that you would advocate sitting back reading the newspaper and not worrying about this. What are the things that our, our clients ought to be focused on uh, in order to stay resilient to and aware of the changes that are coming ahead? You know, one of the things that, that we've certainly talked to some clients about um, is looking at things that they can do voluntarily that would be sensible for them to do anyway and and um and perhaps just understanding what those may be uh, and one of the reasons i mention that is in terms of what we can expect from epa on climate change there was that document that was published called climate climate 21 um and and many of the authors of that document, including Joe Goffman, who is the head of the air office, are not are now in the administration. So I, I still think that's a uh, that's a worthwhile thing to do is just be aware of what it says there. It specifically talks about um, non regulatory approaches for dealing with climate change and especially in the industrial sector where they don't have really good regulatory tools. Right. And so I, I think there are, are opportunities um, across industry groups and, and at specific companies. Um, so, I, you know, I, I know that most companies today are, 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 are looking for energy efficiency improvements they could make, um, if, especially if they're, they're using um, any high GWP uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, as part of their operations, I mean, they're, they're looking, for, I think, for opportunities to to do that. Um, and then the other thing that a, a, a lot of folks, including folks who are on this call, are looking at the, um, the, the, the possibility of getting 45 cube tax credits for CCS. And um, my experience has been that for certain types of facilities, $50 a ton makes CCS projects environment are economically attractive, um, as well as sort of attractive from a from a from a customer and investor relations perspective and ESG perspective. You know, I, and and so, you know, I, I I I've been well as you know, I've spent a fair amount of my time in the in the last year working on Class Six underground injection control permitting issues. And the question, the number of questions we get about those types of permits, the number of projects we hear about is impressive. And I, and I think that people should continue to look for those. And I think the politics means that those 45 Q credits are going to be um, likely extended and maybe even made more, more generous because that kind of, at, you know, there's many, many different ways to deal with climate change because I've come out of the EPA perspective, I think a lot about regulations but there are other ways, including tax policy, that may ultimately be more effective. Do you think there's any any prospect of legislation on on climate change specifically? You know, um, it, it, of course, it's easy to say no because it's been you know historically impossible to pass climate change legislation. Right. I, I I I think that you know what what is climate change legislation? Are you talking about you know, tax credits. Are you talking about R and D efforts to identify new technologies? Um, in terms of sort of the kind of regulatory program that we all think about, I, I think there's a possibility for a clean energy standard. Um, mm. uh, I, I don't 
think that there's support for the, the kind of clean energy standard that the Biden administration has called for, which would mean, you know, zeroing out CO2 emissions or net zero emissions by 2035. But um, I think there are a lot of folks in the in the power sector who are headed in, in that direction, who have their own, own internal targets and believe that a, a, a thoughtful clean energy standard would be a relatively cost effective way to to begin to decarbonize. So in the business community, this there's there's significant support for it. Um, there's certainly interest among Democrats, um, but I think a lot of Republicans are just concerned that politically doing things on climate change in many districts could expose them to challenges from the right. And there's you know there's politics at play there. So I, I think a C, I think think a, C, a CES a clean energy standard is 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 possible. I I don't know that we'll have it this Congress, but I, I think there's enough interest that I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had something like that in the in the relatively near future. I I think it has more impetus behind it than than other kinds of initiatives. That makes total sense. Well, this has been an interesting foray, uh, kind of on the EP, from the EPA perspective on on, on climate. What I want to do is maybe shift the discussion a little bit um, and to Anne also more uh, to look at federal lands, because it's, as, as Jeff, as you pointed out, you know, it's not just regulatory initiatives, right? There, there are lots of kinds of initiatives and, and certainly that encompasses uh, federal policy governing um, the use of uh, the lands that they have one form of control over, over another uh, or, or another. And there, and there are lots of different lands that fit that, that bill. And, Obviously, you spent your career working on these issues. I'm, I'm to start us off. Can you just remind us? You know, Jeff mentioned the Climate 21 as the advance notice of what was going to be coming. Uh, what, what was candidate Biden uh, signaling uh, as to climate change uh, with respect to federal land management? Just to sort of start the bidding there, and then we can look at how that's rolling through the agencies now. Sure. So, as I'm sure, you know, folks on the on the call remember, candidate Biden um, was promising to um, end um, production of oil and gas from public lands um, and coal um, in his administration as a way of reducing the emission of greenhouse gases. Um, and, you know, I think probably a lot of folks um, here with us today have heard some of the statistics, but I think they're worth considering um, because it kind of helps, I think, understand the place of public lands in the overall dialogue. Um, so in the Trump administration, there was an estimate that production and combustion of federal mineral resources um, amounted to nearly 25% of the nation's annual greenhouse gas emissions. Um, which is certainly a pretty significant figure, and I think that's what makes it attractive um, to the administration in terms of getting towards the goal that it wants to reach. Um, I think, interestingly, when you're looking only at the Bureau of Land Management, um, I think the most recent numbers are that BLM has under lease um, for production of federal mineral resources 26.6 million acres out of 700 million acres um, that the agency manages. But that's far from as high as it's ever been. Back in 1985, they had 120 million acres under lease. Um, so just kind of interesting numbers, I think, to put the conversation in context. So that's interesting. Pe people do sort of have the conventional wisdom or belief that an enormous amount of federal lands, indeed, if not all of federal lands, are used for mineral development. And in fact, it's a fraction and it's lower now than it has been in, in prior generations and administrations. Um, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Technological, um, more can be accomplished uh, with a much smaller footprint uh, physically uh, because of real industrial, uh, ind industrially driven um, technology development. It's just to a credit to the industry, um, not so much government policy. So that there's a lot there. So so clearly um, the candidate Biden was signaling a pretty harsh approach to the use of federal lands uh, to really to cut off their use for fossil. Um, that 
that uh, announced itself through some early statements and policy directives, and, and there were some changes. So lead us through that a little bit, but, but in particular to get to where we are now so that we can talk about where we think we're heading. Sure, I, and I wonder if you would indulge me before we kind of start really diving down into those details. I want to talk a little bit more about my favorite environmental statute, the National Environmental Policy Act. Oh. Um, <laughs> just because just because it's integral to what the Department of the Interior okay. is, is doing and moving I'll, forward. I'll let you set the table with the tablecloth of NEPA, which of course is one of my favorite statutes. So that, that's okay, but we're going to come back to uh, you know, FLIPMA and, and, and everything else too, because the, the, those those are the big candelabra on the on the on the dining room table, right? Uh, so, uh, absolutely. And what I want to say about NEPA is really just very brief. I mean, it, you know, everybody hears about NEPA, NEPA, NEPA all the time. Whether it slows down agency decision making, has gotten overly complicated, gets projects tied up in litigation, um, and of course the Trump administration. Um, issued a complete redo, um, a very dramatic redo of the regulations implementing NEPA. And as as I mentioned, um, certainly we're going to see another redo by this administration of those regulations. But what I really want to emphasize is that what I'm looking for, especially in the climate context, is not, you know, are the agencies going to be required to do more analysis, more complicated analysis, because you know, yes, it impacts private sector projects in terms of cost and timeline, but I think ultimately the real key is what are the agencies going to do with that information now? Um, because we've seen a lot of agencies kind of analyze climate, but it doesn't really drive their decision making. And so one of the things that the Department of the Interior has flagged up front is consideration of how this information developed under NEPA is going to really drive decision making. Um, so that's kind of the gloss that I wanted yeah. to put on our conversation about interior and, and that that really is a fair contextual point because um, and and I want to take it up more formally a, a little later in the conversation and expand upon it because it really is central. How do you drive NEPA analysis into the statutory the action statute decision making that has to happen under all these different statutes that that to to greater or lesser degrees. Uh, uh, allow or, or, or don't allow um, environmental considerations to be part of the analysis. And what do you do with that? And, and does that get tested ultimately in court? And I think there's some specific discussions there that we can have around infrastructure permitting. Um, but let's, with that context, let's think about the federal land use and, and where the president, as opposed to the candidate, has moved things and, with, and sort of where that's heading. So fill us in there. Sure, and and you know I think I think this is really key, obviously, for so many sectors and so many folks on the phone, even where you don't directly engage with production of federal lands, simply because of the downstream consequences to any number of businesses and the economy of what the Department of the Interior is doing. So, of course, the president directed Interior um, to pause oil and gas leasing um, consistent with applicable law. Um, in order to evaluate the program. And so the Department of the Interior did that fairly quickly um, and not only has stopped issuing new leases, um, but kind of canceled some lease sales that were in mid process, um, both for the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And those cancellations um, and the pause generally are the subject of very active court cases in Louisiana and Wyoming. Um, and it's it's interesting to watch those cases because that's where the government is really, for the first time, articulating its rationale for the ability to pause and reshape the oil and gas leasing program. Um, and it it is somewhat of a novel approach. Um, and so back to Jeff's notation of creative arguments, um, you know, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how they develop the legal rationale for the path forward. So in any event, you know, we're paused um, and a report is due apparently to the White House in June as to Interior's initial assessment and next steps. Um, I imagine that will be publicly released relatively promptly. Um, as Interior announces 
what it is going to do next, but there's certainly no indication that it's going to go back to some level of leasing anytime soon. Although I would note um, that Interior actually has issued some oil and gas leases since January 20th. Um, they were subject of lease sales held before the inauguration in January. Um, so, you know, they have taken somewhat in any event of um, a modulated approach to the issue. So that's you know, where we are with the pause. Let, let me ask you just before we go on from there, you know, pause is such a polite word for something that has such massive consequences economically uh, to the country and, and to many businesses. Uh, but nevertheless, that's the lingo these days, a pause. Um, my, my question is, Congress under many of these statutes directed um, the executive branch to ensure the gainful use of the public lands for public benefit. How does an administration creatively or otherwise handle those statutes that have a, I'll call it a development lien or a development charge in them? How do you square that with a quote pause, uh, at least for any length of time, i.e. a new policy of not leasing? Does that work? Or does that just go straight to court and get overturned? Well, let me take that on in the context of the Mineral Leasing Act, and then maybe I could turn to you on the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act um, and what Boeing is doing there. Well, that'll be um, fun. Yeah, and I, and I, and I want to and I want to understand where those where they fit in in your dinner party analogy because I'm having a hard time figuring out what we have after we have the tablecloth and the candle. I know, I know. <laughs> like, well, so. You know, with the, the Bureau of Land Management and onshore oil and gas leasing is subject to the Mineral Leasing Act. Um, and the, a lot of people read the Mineral Leasing Act to direct the Department of the Interior to hold quarterly oil and gas lease sales. Um, and there is a provision of the Mineral Leasing Act um, that so indicates. Um, but there are other provisions of the Mineral Leasing Act um, that say that the secretary has the discretion to hold the lease sales, that the secretary may hold lease sales. Even that quarterly lease sale provision um, refers to available or eligible lands for leasing. Um, and so the Department of the Interior is now the view that the secretary has broad discretion under the Mineral Leasing Act, whether to advance parcels for lease for oil and gas production, um, and that you know, being eligible or available means a lot of different things, like whether there's been full NEPA compliance. Um, and the department may take the view that the NEPA analysis supporting the re recently canceled sales um, has been insufficient because it didn't sufficiently take into account the climate consequences of those sales, for example. Um, there's also the hook, which is, you know, perhaps another one of the dinner plates or the candelabras of the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, which applies broadly to public lands um, and, and gives BLM a very broad mandate in that BLM is when considering management actions and uses of public lands to consider harmonious and coordinated management of various resources, um, to ensure it is not allowing permanent impairment of land and the quality of the environment, things like that, that the department is currently reading along with the Mineral Leasing Act um, to support the way forward. And I imagine from, from the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act perspective, there is a similar um, kind of theme. You know, I, I sometimes ask myself um, in our constitutional system, when Congress issues a statute, uh, FLIPMA or OXLA, whichever one it is, and it's been interpreted for decades in a particular way, namely that there is a mandate or a charge to actually develop within certain constraints, but to develop. Um, and that gets reinterpreted by the executive branch under Article 2, you know, um, to say, well, no, actually, that's discretionary. I, I, I do wonder if one could go back in time and say, so did you mean to pass this statute and nothing happened actually? You know, I, I, I think that there's a there's a real tension there and perhaps it's most manifest when, when we look at Oxford. And so I'll, I'll, I'll let you turn the, 
the uh, the sword of the questioner on me here. Um, so let me just make a few remarks in 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 comparison to what you've said on on, on the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, which which oversees the the development of the OCS, the federal submerged lands um, out several miles uh, from the shore. That has been the bedrock statute for all offshore leasing um, for any purpose, traditionally oil, gas, and sulfur leasing. And then as, as a result of some uh, amendments uh, more recently, also leasing of the OCS for the purpose of, of generating power from non-fossil um, uh, sources. It could be wave energy or other form of hydrokinetic energy um, and certainly wind. And we hear offshore wind every day of the week, every moment of every day from the Biden administration. But what's interesting is that Oxler, of course, has an, a very lengthy um, sort of preambulatory uh, language, but it's not a preamble. It's actually the first section of the statute itself that enshrines the purposes that Congress had in passing the act. And most prominently among them, I would uh, argue, uh, are the words, the expeditious and orderly development. That's a quote. Um, you know, that there is no shying from the congressional directive. You will develop um, the OCS for the benefit of the country. Does that mean that you, um, you, you just run roughshod over all the environmental considerations? Of course not, because there's a comma after expeditious and orderly development, and it recognizes subject to environmental safeguards and, among other things, Competition. Hmm. Interesting idea there. Um, as to the environmental safeguards, Oxla has always considered and allowed the consideration of environmental impacts uh, uh, analysis, but that was supposed to inform the pace and scope of development through leasing rather than to block it uh, just to jure across the board. Uh, to take that position now, I think, would be very, very difficult. Uh, to succeed when it gets to an Article Three court. So what I'm looking for on traditional offshore oil and gas development is how they want to use NEPA as the point of constriction, as you foreshadowed, to allow themselves not to have to do significant, maybe some, but not significant oil and gas leasing um, again going forward. They have to do that through a, you know, a multi-year plan that gets presented, or a program that gets presented to Congress. Uh, it used to be uh, that it was presented, and it's a, it's a five-year plan, so it extends beyond the term of any one uh, presidential term. But presidents increasingly have been willing to take the existing plan, even though it has been congressionally approved, and just rewrite it uh, in media's race. And I suspect we're going to see that again here. We're going to see the continual rewriting of the quote five year plan until there's just complete disarray. I think that disarray itself is a, I would say, a co benefit uh, in the eyes of the Biden administration. Um, they're perfectly pleased with that uh, uh, outcome, I suspect. So, on Oxla, to answer your question, and I, I think the statute is has language that's a real impediment to an across the board prohibition on development for oil and gas, but they can look to the new subsection P, which is the renewable energy side of Oxla and say, well, this is, this is the way we're going to develop. So we're going to be developing, we're just not going to be leasing through the traditional program, and we'll let that atrophy like a vestigial organ uh, until it falls off or blows up like an appendix. Um, we'll have to see. So there I've moved the metaphor, unfortunately, to a medical one. Probably shouldn't have done that. Um, let me turn back, though, uh, to, to turn the questions back to you and, and, and Jeff. You know, where you've, you've talked about kind of the position on future leasing, but where are we in terms of threats to the pre-existing federal, ex, you know, currently existing oil and gas leases and authorizations and the terms of them, royalties, everything else? Do you see anything shifting there or is that solid and bankable? Well, you know, the administration's position has been that they are going to proceed with orderly development of existing leases. Um, and after their initial decision to bring all oil and gas development related decisions to headquarters, um, which caused delays and confusion and uncertainty, they have now redelegated most of those, but not all. 
um, back to the field. And so approvals, for example, of permits to drill on an oil and gas lease seem to be proceeding apace and fairly normally. Um, you know, I think there continues to be potential um, as the Department of the Interior further evaluates how it wants to move their climate priority forward um, in terms of, you know, perhaps changing the nature of NEPA review related to APDs, permits to drill, um, perhaps changing the nature of mitigation that may be required. Um, I think there are all of those opportunities. Um, you know, setting aside those kinds of opportunities, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're trying to figure out how or if to reinstate the Obama era venting and flaring rule, for example, um, that was intended to um, reduce or eliminate venting and flaring of methane. Um, that's going to be, I think, a little bit complicated given how the judicial review of that rule went. Um, but I imagine that's something that would ex impact existing leases that could be considered. Um, and clearly, administration officials are very set on dramatically updating all sorts of fees, um, royalties, bonds, everything like that, that may or may not have implications for existing leases. So really three buckets there, um, uh, exploring new, new conditions, flaring and venting, exploring um, mitigation. I want to double back on that as to what that might look like and exploring uh, new financial terms of all kinds um, in order to shape behavior and constrain behavior. Um, let me pick up uh, the mitigation piece. You know, traditionally, medi mitigation in, in, in many contexts, many statutes has been very focused on impact mitigation. Mitigation is supposed to be very specific to the impact. I mean, that's the, that's the theory of it, is that, is that this action that would be, that we're calling mitigation is supposed to actually um, uh, uh, address or compensate, I don't mean financially, but, but redress in certain uh, uh, ways, the impact that's felt here um, that's been identified in the analysis. And yet I strongly sense that mitigation is is being viewed much more broadly than that. That mitigation could range far beyond the sort of specific impact that has been identified. It's kind of like, oh, we found an impact. Now that we found an impact, you know, the the, the candy store is open uh, for for you know asking for lots and lots of different sweets. How do you see that? What are the constraints there that you see under the statute uh, or case law? Well, and I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I certainly think in the context of mitigation, that's what passed is pretty much prologue. Um, in 2016, the solicitor of the Department of the Interior issued a legal opinion on the Bureau of Land Management's authority over mitigation for actions on public lands, any sort of actions that, you know, didn't have to be oil and gas related. Um, and that opinion, while lengthy, I will distill into a couple of sentences, um, which is basically that under the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, BLM has exceedingly broad authority um, over mitigation um, for impacts to public lands. And in fact, that the Bureau of Land Management can seek a net conservation benefit um, to compensate for impacts on public lands. So not only is the concept some sort of direct offset, like you'd see in a wetlands con context, one acre to one acre, um, you know, the 2016 solicitor saw authority to go beyond that to seek a benefit, a net conservation benefit. That concept was very controversial, immediately withdrawn in the Trump administration. Um, but I expect we will see it back um, and under the 2016 opinion, the Department of the Interior's manual on mitigation actually with respect to climate specifically directed bureaus to identify and promote mitigation measures to help address the effects of climate change. Um, what those are, I don't think they ever really developed specifically and it was withdrawn, but I expect to see that pursued. And, and I suspect we're going to see, see climate mitigation and environmental justice mitigation uh, combining to make it even more uh, interesting and the mitigation measures even more far afield from, I would say, traditional concepts of redress 
for the specific incremental new in, impact. I think we're going to see redress um, of, of legacy issues on, on climate, such as additional resilience building or redress for failure to, to build resilience in shoreline communities and, and whatever it may be. Um, this, Kevin, this if Kevin, if I could just do a, a logistics check, we have about 25 minutes left. Um, I know ideally we were hoping to have time for a few questions, but I also know we want to hear your views on what FERC is doing amongst other things. So I just wanted to do a time check. Yep. I, and these uh, guests are free to use the chat. That's the best way to indicate. I've been checking that um, occasionally, but I don't see any Q&A there except for one that actually has just come through to me. Ah. Well, in just, let's, just, let's just take it. Um, will industry influence and global policy have a greater impact on U.S. climate change activities than regulations? So, industry more influential than regulations. Examples would include the Shell case in the Netherlands and the OGMP. So, that's a particularly, I think, a thoughtful question uh, from a thoughtful client and, and friend. Um, uh, why don't I start the bidding there and, and then um, we can circle around on it and then I will turn to infrastructure permitting and, and some of the other topics we have. And I encourage others who are um, listening uh, among our clients to use the Q&A button um, to, to poke us with your own observations or queries. So, I think to the base question, um, will will the industry side of or industry efforts and global policy e end up shaping the future uh, of U.S. climate change activities more than the regulatory effort will? Um, and I think that there is a very good argument to be made that it, that it will, um, or at least will equal it. And and that that's that's in itself, I think, quite a statement because in the United States, particularly in environmental law. The regulatory uh, direction has has pretty much established the momentum uh, in, in our country. Um, uh, you know, industry um, uh, moves can occasionally move the needle more than anything else. We, we think of, of, for example, uh, how the chemical industry responded to the Popal uh, uh, incident and tragedy. You know, that was an extraordinary effort to develop. Uh, internationally, a, a really new perspective on process safety uh, in that industry, and it far outstripped anything that was regulatorily there. Uh, and there was an impetus to do it. Uh, there was a very strong impetus to do it because that action must never be repeated again. And I think everyone understood that. Uh, so that that can happen, but those are sort of peaks uh, uh, occasionally in our history. But but generally, it's a regulatory mandate that moves. What's different that I see here now is that. The social impetus around us, not just the politics of it, but just the, the, the social cultural impetus is extremely strong uh, for climate change action, or whatever that is, um, and has, has manifested itself in bank policy um, uh, and in shareholder actions to a degree that really is beginning to constrain things like access to capital for certain kinds of companies. Or the, or the expense and timeliness of, of access to capital. These kinds of movements um, are much broader than individual agency regulatory uh, efforts, and, and yet they affect the bottom line of companies. And so companies are seeing that they can't just have a compliance mindset on climate change, saying, well, what the regs say, we're gonna do what the regs says, no problem. They say, well, we gotta do, it's, it's not just the reg. We have stakeholders uh, among shareholders, we have the stock exchanges, we have the ratings companies, we have the banks, uh, all of them affect our, our, our dollars and cents. And we have to be responsive to them in ways that the regulator uh, 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 has not forced us to be yet. I'd be interested, Jeff, in your take on that question. Do, do you think that industry um, moves and, and global policy development here is actually gonna gain the edge on the regulatory impetus? I guess the first comment I would make is I don't know that there's really a, a distinction between sort of international uh, developments and corporate action. I mean, we, we saw after the Paris Climate Accord was agreed to, there really was 
a uh, a, a wave of actions by individual companies sort of taking stock of their uh, of their greenhouse gas emissions and 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 so i i think i think those things i, I think a lot of, of of companies especially in the en en energy industry are are keenly aware of what's being discussed at the at the international level at the upcoming cop for for example and it has been interesting to me to see um you know, a, a combination of ESG kind of concerns and technology development and incentives has really changed the, the power sector in a, in a very fundamental way. Um, so I, I, I don't, and, 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 we're, and we're saying the same thing in, in other industries as well, where I think there is a real acknowledgement that there's a social, social contract to operate that, that, that companies want to be good citizens. Um, but but I think there are limits to to what can be done um, without regulatory kind of policy, and I and I don't know that we've identified those yet, and it, and it may be, and I think the hope of many is that technology develops in a way that will continue to you know to drive us towards um, a, a much lower carbon world. So I guess the short answer is I, I think. You would have to say that that sort of corporate policy and international focus on this issue, um, in some ways, ha has has affected um, uh, CO two emissions more than any government actions thus far. But it's not clear, you know, that that will be enough to 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 address the concerns that many people have have raised. Um, yeah. get, getting to a fifty percent reduction. It is it will be expensive, but then getting from you know the last whether it's fifty percent or is is uh, at least given what we know today is likely to be much more much more costly. Yeah, it definitely will. And you know, with respect to the international industrial efforts, OGMP was referenced in the question of the oil and gas methane partnership, um, where. Increasingly, companies are signing on to accept commitments, that is to say, to make commitments um, to achieve uh, particular goals that are agreed in the OGMP uh, context for reduction of scope one, two, and three emissions. And and the method by which they're going to do that, and the method by which they're going to measure and and document that, and that's all um, outside the regulatory context. In some sense, it's kind of like, you know, it's like uh, Fukuyama and you know, post history. It's sort of post regulatory action. It's it's self regulatory action in a way that might be interesting to see. Uh, I don't know where OGMP ultimately is heading, uh, how successful it will be, how attractive it will it will be to companies that are trying to make a lot of decisions right now about how to how to um, create a resilient footprint. Uh, participating in OGMP may feel uh, like too much too fast for many in industry, but I think some are participating and feel like that's that's something that can drive the discussion. So I think the next couple of years will really show us a lot. Hey, hey Kevin, can I, can I just make one quick comment? Um, in my discussion about uh, sort of the Clean Air Act and how it might be used, I, I mentioned that the agency was looking at sort of voluntary partnerships. I, I don't want to leave the impression that they're not also exploring regulatory approaches. And so, you know, for some so for some industries beyond the power sector, they are certainly looking at um, at, at regulation under Section 111. And, and I think people should just be aware and follow that and be be thinking about the types of things that EPA might be might be considering. So. I didn't want him to dismiss the possibility that we will, and in fact, we, we will likely will see other sectors regulated under Section 111. I think that that's the thing. To have. Um, we'll, we'll certainly see action there uh, on many fronts in the regulatory nature. And that, that brings me maybe to, to infrastructure permitting. And Anne, you, you, you flipped the mic again towards me with respect to FERC, and maybe I'll, I'll hum a bar on that. Um, and, and then also, I want to turn back to just maybe the Corps of Engineers and what's happening there with the nationwide permits and, and, and the like, which is so important to so much infrastructure of varying kinds, energy and non-energy related. So at FERC, I mean, today's the is, is actually the it's the 26th. I'm, I'm reminded to look at my 
my calendar. Um, well, comments are being filed uh, today uh, as the deadline uh, to FERC um, uh, with respect to their reopening or rejuvenation of a, of a prior docket, um, an earlier docket from a few years ago, um, uh, colloquially called the NOI on the CPS, which is to say that the, the, the notice, uh, they put out a notice to gather comments from the regulated industry, in this case, interstate natural gas industry, um, about how they should and whether they, they, the FERC should modify the certificate policy statement, which is the blueprint document, the, the, the relatively long and, and, and somewhat magical document that says how the commission looks at the public convenience and necessity, the PCN, in coming to the determination that it should or shouldn't, and if so, under what conditions, approve an interstate natural gas pipe and other kinds of things that are jurisdictional. And to reopen that blueprint document really is like reopening the genome, you know, and say, should we splice in a couple of more G's, A's, T's, and C's, and, and in what order should we do it? It's a big deal. Uh, you change the DNA, and 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 everything that is expressed by that DNA changes immediately. So um, the special focus in this reopening uh, of public comment was on climate change and on environmental justice. And we'll take up climate change uh, in today's discussion. Actually, some more on justice um, and environmental equity tomorrow uh, with our guests. But today um, on climate. I think the big debate, and Anne, you foreshadowed this, the question really is, okay, well, we all know that FERC does a really rigorous NEPA review. It's huge. I mean, it's enormous. They implemented NEPA through Part 380, and we, we build these, these stacks of, you know, 13 resource reports, yay high, and then there's an independent uh, EP, excuse me, EIS that's built on top of that by the consultant, the FERC, whom the developer pays for. And so there's just an enormous amount of, uh, of, of impact analysis, probably as as orderly a NEPA process as any federal agency has, in, in my opinion, that, that ends up permitting infrastructure. And that has always considered uh, um, or been able to consider impacts to the environment, including climate, so atmospheric issues. Not an issue, always been. The question has been how far upstream and downstream do you look in setting the scope of the NEPA analysis if what the agency is doing is authorizing the construction and operation of a uh, transportation pipeline, not authorizing gas production or use, not authorizing the upstream activities that, that, that produce the gas, not authorizing the consumption of the gas or the further use of the gas uh, downstream to make plastics or, or things that I'm wearing here. Uh, no. Uh, just that, then, then, then what is the proper scope? And we have guidance from the Supreme Court and elsewhere about um, the necessity for limiting the scope of NEPA analysis to uh, what is not only reasonably foreseeable as a result of the federal action, in this case, authorizing a, a pipeline, but also there needs to be an adequate degree of causation a, a causative degree of control, if you will, of the federal agency over the activity that leads to, and of course, FERC has absolutely no regulatory control. In fact, expressly, it, its authority is excluded uh, over upstream activity, oil and gas production. And it has no authority to regulate downstream, say, combustion from a power plant or something else. Other agencies have that authority, EPA under the Clean Air Act. Go talk to Mr. Homestead, he'll tell you all about that. So FERC doesn't. So the question is, should should FERC be looking upstream and downstream? And there's going to be a lot of commentary filed today with with FERC, and and I think the positions are going to range the full gamut, from extremely strong advocacy by environmental groups and others uh, that FERC needs to take climate change very very seriously, and therefore should view its causative relation to upstream and downstream impacts uh, as as within its charge. Uh, uh, I think from industry, you're going to see a much more tempered view that is much more uh, focused on the actual words of the statute and, and what the authority of EPA is. So we'll need to watch that closely. The second piece of that is, okay, so once you've done the climate analysis of whatever kind and scope it is, how far up and downstream you look, okay, when you've sent it and you have your analysis and it's, you know, X greenhouse gases uh, in tons, 
uh, produced, how do you get from there to an impact? It's really tough. And do you use the social cost of carbon? And is that a reliable enough measure? And folk is asking that question also. Is SEC good? How should we use it? With emphasis on the second part, because it looks pretty clear that uh, Commissioner Click would like to use it. Uh, and that the expectation is that folk will use something like the social cost of carbon to try to get from a tonnage of greenhouse gas emissions to an impact of some kind. Um, but there's a lot of concern over the reliability of the social cost of carbon calculation, its original purposes, the limitations of its inputs, and the somewhat grandiose assumptions uh, that are built into it um, as it was built for, for different purposes to begin with. We're going to see that um, sort of built out in the docket here uh, very, very soon. And then finally, we confront the question, uh, FERC confronts the question, well, Let's say we do translate the tonnage into an impact by some mechanism, magic or otherwise. Our statute says we have to certificate, we have to approve the interstate natural gas pipeline if it meets these statutory criteria. And, and none of those criteria, as we look at them, includes sort of climate change or greenhouse gases. What do we do with that? Does it affect only our conditioning authorities? We might ask for mitigation or, or conditions on, on use. Uh, of the authorization that we offer, or should we view the public convenience as a necessity as necessarily including concerns about climate change? That would be the game changer. And that, I think, is the direction in which uh, the Biden administration would like to go, but of course the FERC is an independent agency, even if it from time to time is very well aligned with its incumbent president. So the short there is, this is an incredibly interesting moment in time, and I think we're going to see a lot coming out of the docket, uh, filed into the docket and coming out of that uh, in the course of this summer and within this year in terms of new policy announcements and potentially regulatory developments and changes to the CPS by the FERC. Uh, one last footnote on that is the CPS was unanimous. The, the blueprint document was unanimous, and it is devoutly to be hoped that any new or revised CPS will be unanimous. Because to have the energy infrastructure of this country in the natural gas side entirely dependent on a non-unanimous blueprint um, is, is really a treacherous terrain upon which to make very large investments. And Corps of Engineers, what's going on with the NWPs? I need them. I can't build without them. <laughs> Well, I, just very briefly, um, given that we're running out of time, um, first of all, what's going on with the NWPs? I mean, they're so far, they're still available to everybody. Um, the current, you know, there are two current sets of nationwide permits, which is a little bit unusual. <clears throat> There's what I call the main set of nationwide permits, which will expire after its normal five year term um, in March of 2022. And I expect that the Corps of Engineers in early fall ish. Um, will release a draft set of nationwide permits for public review and comment as it moves toward that deadline. Um, of course, the Trump administration Corps of Engineers um, reissued some of the nationwide permits to include nationwide permit 12, which applies to oil and gas pipelines um, in January of this year. Technically, those don't expire for another five years. Um, but I anticipate that the core will roll it all together because they're going to want everything to get back on its normal five year mm -hmm. rate. They don't want it. It's too confusing. So I expect that um, at this point, I expect that the opportunity to consider how climate factors into the nationwide permits, if it does at all, um, will be taken up um, kind of in the normal course of the review of the nationwide permit program. Um, nationwide Permit 12 is still the subject of litigation in the Ninth Circuit, but that's the 2017 version, which really hardly applies to anything anymore because of the new issuance this year. Um, so, however that turns out, I don't expect it will have a, a significant um, impact. It's going to be very interesting to see what the Corps does um, with climate. Of course, for years, um, the Corps has fairly successfully taken the position that it does not need to consider um, impacts and very specifically greenhouse gases and climate impacts that you know are really far afield from its fairly narrow jurisdiction under the Rivers and Harbors Act or Clean Water Act. 
um, it has been absolutely steadfast in that position. You know, I mean, I I prepped witnesses for congressional testimony on that subject from the core, and they were very steadfast in the face of heavy criticism. So I think it's going to take a lot to move the core off that position. Um, and as you know, the core itself has no political appointees. Um, that being said, I think the core is already considering how you know it might respond to this policy priority of the administration um, and incorporate consideration of climate into some of its permitting activities. Um, I would note that the core has kind of the used to be kind of low key public interest regulations, um, which are in addition to NEPA aren't Clean Water Act specifically and require the core to consider some very broad categories of public interest concerns, including economics, which the core has generally done very briefly and kind of focused on the positive of the project. So it'll be interesting to see if that becomes a hook potentially for considering climate um, and negative economic impacts. So that's what to look out for in the core. And I'm just gonna take 30 more seconds just to mention something that we haven't really had the opportunity to talk about, but that I am really um, interested in these days, which is the Endangered Species Act and climate. Um, because I think the administration is gonna be looking at, you know, everything from listing decisions under the act to designating critical habitat, to interpreting federal agency obligations through a climate lens. And we'll probably be looking to, again, revise some of the ESA regulations that the Trump administration changed um, to allow um, agencies to kind of get away from climate under the Endangered Species Act. So I think we're gonna see that revisited. I've also seen some folks suggest that the take prohibitions, which of course are very serious in section nine of the Endangered Species Act should apply to greenhouse gas emitting activities. So if climate is threatening take of species and you're responsible for greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to that, I've seen people suggest that your activity should be illegal without a permit. So that may not go very far, um, but again, I think ESA is really something to to watch. I think you've, you, you're very right to highlight the species side of this, and if we had well enough in time, we would, we would take that even further. Um, occasionally, I feel like reminding people when they talk about restricting all greenhouse gases, you know, stop talking because, you know, you've got carbon dioxide coming out of your mouth. So, in any event, maybe that's the pandemic lesson of masks. We should all wear these masks. Um, I'm going to leave it there, uh, but first, thank uh, thanking both Jeff and Anne for their time and thoughtfulness today. And I want to thank all of our guests for having listened and participated at least intellectually with us today. Uh, we look forward to having you all join us again tomorrow for further rich discussion um, of uh, other issues in our seminar. Be well, be healthy. Thank you. <laughs>